Hello, everyone. You are listening to a brand new solo episode of the Preventive Medicine Podcast. My name is Raghav. Thank you guys for tuning into the show. And today we're going to be talking about exercise. Now, before you tune out, this is not going to be like a boring exercise has these benefits, exercise does this, and kind of a claim to have you exercise. I'm going to unpack exercise as best I can and as, as concisely as I can for um, kind of the pur purposes of preventive medicine. So stay tuned. Let's get into it. Overcoming saber toothed tigers and woolly mammoths we must now face a new enemy, ourselves. With the rates of diseases such as heart disease, stroke, diabetes, depression, and many others ballooning, we must find a better solution to these modern epidemics. Welcome to the Preventive Medicine Podcast. We believe in building a foundation of health by means of prevention so that you can build the life you want and find fulfillment with no barriers. Hear from experts around the country on how to take your health into your hands. Take control and build a foundation of health for the life that you want to live. And now, here's the show. All right, everyone. So I'm going to be breaking down this episode into kind of uh, five main parts. And the first one is going to be a very brief definition of exercise. Um, we're going to start talking a little bit about the guidelines and why it's so important um, with the current sedentary lifestyle epidemic and lack of exercise epidemic uh, that we're facing um, kind of globally. Uh, we're going to talk about exercise as a tool for health and then the different types of exercise and then making exercise accessible and how to get people um, exercising a little bit more. And um, once again, as a disclaimer, I'm not a exercise professional at this current moment. Um, I am studying for my CSCS, so I guess I will have the certification to be an exercise professional, but we're not talking about that. So first off, what is exercise? Now, there's a bunch of different definitions out there, but from what I like piece together from what's meaningful to me is that um, exercise is focused and purposeful physical activity that requires a physical effort beyond what is required in the other activities of your life. So for example, if your day job is just like sitting at a desk, um, typing away as most people's are these days, then anything that is physically purposeful that requires you to do more activity than that would technically be considered exercise. Whereas if someone is um, kind of out and doing more type of manual labor stuff, then something a little bit beyond that would be physical exercise for that person. Um, so when it comes to exercise, there's typically three main forms. There's resistance training, which is kind of um, purposeful for strength training, building muscle, hypertrophy, and all those kinds of things. Cardiovascular training. And then the third one is balance and flexibility. In this podcast, we're pretty much just going to address the first two, which are resistance training and cardiovascular training. I'll try to get a uh, expert on kind of balance and flexibility on a little bit later because those two are, in my opinion, as of right now, not as important. I think it's more important to get people resistance training and doing cardiovascular training, but I'll dive into that literature and I will update you if anything changes with my opinion. So the second part of this is kind of the guidelines. So for those of you who are unaware, the exercise guidelines pretty much globally are um, pretty set. And that is a minimum of 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise every single week. And also, in addition to that, two whole body resistance training sessions. Now, um, this is kind of the bare minimum that is set as a guideline, and there aren't really maximums. Um, and doing research for a recent Instagram post that I had on my own personal page, um, kind of the upper limit of that is if you start doing five to six hours of vigorous exercise. And by vigorous, it means like hit style training of just like sprinting. Um, and moderate exercise is more like walking at a 3.5 to 4 mile an hour pace, all those kinds of things. If you want um, exactly to know what counts as moderate and as uh, vigorous, then I'm going to include a thing in the show notes down below, which kind of has it laid out um, for what was count as moderate and what would count as uh, vigorous. On top of that, don't forget two whole body resistance training exercise sessions for strength, muscle hypertrophy, those kinds of things. Now let's talk about why this is important and kind of what's going on um, behind the sedentary lifestyle epidemic in kind of globally. Now, I'm mostly going to talk about the United States because that's where I live and that's where a lot of the data is that I was able to find for this. And the most shocking thing right here is I knew it was a big problem, but in 2018, according to the CDC, 50% of Americans older than 18 meet the cardiovascular exercise component of the guidelines. But when you start looking at both the cardio and the resistance training aspects, only 18% of Americans older than 18 meet the entire definition of those guidelines. 18%. 
that's about one fifth of individuals. So four and five individuals, if you look outside, if there are people walking around, only one of the next five people will be meeting the minimum exercise guideline requirements. Now, when you look at it um, even further, if you look at strictly like sedentary lifestyle, instead of looking at who is exercising, then you have every state having at least 15% of the population being completely inactive. And that means kind of not engaging in any sort of meaningful exercise on the regular. And you have seven states which are above 30%. So almost a third of citizens in that state are getting no physical activity. And one state even had 43% of people physically inactive. Absolutely mind-blowing. That is shocking. And once again, by being inactive, that means like not doing any physical activity, like maybe zero minutes of uh, moderate intensity, vigorous intensity, and no resistance training. That, that is mind-blowing right there. And as far as the trends that I was seeing when I was researching um, kind of articles for this episode and looking at stats, is that this percentage is only increasing. And we can point fingers to a lot of different things, such as everyone being more reliant on technology to get things done. We all kind of just sit in cars to go everywhere now. Um, we always use our computers for work, all these kinds of things. You can point fingers everywhere, but... The data shows that we are increasing our sedentary lifestyle as a whole, and that includes um, children, adolescents, adults, the elderly, everyone. It's across the board. Now, I'm not going to harp on that too long because we could go on for that for probably quite some time. We can dig up a lot of stats that support that. But I don't think we really need to because that's kind of like we all inherently start to realize this, that a lot of people don't move as much as they need to. And if you ask anyone, are you exercising as much as you want to, or do you think you should be then, or um, like, do you think you're exercising as much as you should be? Then most people are going to say no. So most people already know this. Now, when it comes to the health risks of a sedentary lifestyle, um, there is actually a lot of data coming out now because people are starting to study this because it's a bigger and bigger epidemic. But we're seeing that the um, adults, most of the data that I saw is in adults, um, adults who have increased television viewing time and overall sedentary time with central adiposity, meaning like uh, more fat over their midsections, have a higher fasting triglyceride levels and then also markers of insulin resistance, which means risk factors for type 2 diabetes. And that's independent of both adiposity and exercise time. So let's say someone is still just exercising in general and um, trying to lose weight, whatever it is, keep their fat off. If they are more sedentary than exercising, then they're still at risk for this. So just exercising at like a set one hour per day doesn't necessarily protect you for this. And then we also find supporting that statement that breaks in sedentary time have a beneficial association on waist circumference, body mass index, triglyceride levels, two hour glucose levels that are once again independent of total sedentary time and exercise time. So pretty much what that means is instead of just sitting there all day and then um, kind of lopping all your exercise into like a 30 minute or one hour thing to meet those guidelines, it's probably a little bit better to space that out. Or if you can't space it out, then at least like get up, take a little bit of break while you're at work doing whatever, walk around and break up that sedentary time. The next part of this podcast is exercise as a tool for health. Now, this is the part that I'm actually currently investigating myself and learning a lot more about because when most people think of exercise, they think of weight loss. That is the first thing that comes to their mind. When you ask someone, um, how do you want to get healthier? How do you plan to lose weight? They say exercise. And what we are finding now is that exercise actually is not a great tool for weight loss. Now, a lot of people might already know this. And if you know this on um, listening to the podcast right now, then you are much smarter than me because this is something that is just now coming to my attention for the past several months. And I'm starting to learn a lot more about it, which is absolutely mind blowing to me. But right now, people think of exercise as a way to lose weight and build muscle. But exercise really isn't good for weight loss. A lot of studies have kind of shown that exercise interventions don't really have that much of an effect on weight loss. And the real effect kind of comes with uh, maybe maintenance of weight loss, but that's kind of about it. So if you have someone who's really trying to lose weight, then it, it comes down to their diet versus exercise. As um, one of the things that I'm not going to dive into too much, but it's kind of the constrained energy expenditure model of like calories versus the additive model, where people think that... Um, losing weight is all about calories in versus calories out, which it is. It's a lot of thermodynamics. So you can theoretically increase the uh, calories out by exercising, right? However, 
It doesn't necessarily work that way, it looks like, because what seems to be more reasonable is the constrained energy expenditure model, which at some point after like exercising, it kind of tapers off and you stay within a set range of calories that you burn. So a lot of weight loss really comes from your diet and not exercise. So what is exercise good for then if it's not for weight loss? And once again, this does not mean that you should not be exercising just because it's not good for weight loss. There's so many other benefits, which we're going to talk about right now. The first one of those is increased cardiorespiratory fitness. And that's something that is tremendously helping me with this podcast so that I have a uh, the breath to <laughs> continue this podcast. But in all seriousness, cardiorespiratory fitness is kind of your ability to um, just use oxygen, I guess, at a um, better capability. I don't know if I have a better definition for this right now, but it's your idea of like someone just running and being able to run a long distance, just being fit in doing that. And cardiorespiratory fitness is an independent risk factor, aside from weight, aside from everything else, independent means on its own. It's an independent risk factor for type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, morbidity, and mortality, and just generally all-cause mortality. So in general, the more cardiorespiratory fit you are, the lower your chance or risk for type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, like effects of that, mortality, and all-cause mortality. And then... Not only does it decrease your risk, but it's both for primary and secondary prevention. And I addressed this in the last podcast um, solo episode that I had um, about kind of the primary, secondary, tertiary prevention. Secondary prevention means if someone does have cardiovascular disease, then it'll assist them in kind of managing that and reducing their risk of further um, complicating that or experiencing complications from cardiovascular disease. So fantastic there. Um, the list goes on and on. Really, if you look at a lot of uh, physicians who lift that talk about exercise as medicine, if you look at like the hashtag exercise as medicine, you might see some posts of like physicians or whoever it is posting a giant list of diseases. And then they say in the caption, if there was a pill that you could take to reduce your risk of all of these things, would you do it? That pill is exercise. And that really is true. The, ex the data has shown that exercise is phenomenal against things like um, just coronary heart disease, uh, COPD, uh, that's your chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Um, you have your hypertension, you have metabolic disorders such as type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, obesity, insulin resistance, and also against your muscle and bone like musculoskeletal diseases such as your rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndromes, osteoporosis, even cancer, and when it comes to it, mental health as well. Things such as depression and even beyond that cognitive disorders such as Alzheimer's, dementia, all of those kinds of things. So really there's a laundry list that exercise is beneficial for. And once again, that I wanna stress, this is independent of weight loss. So just engaging in meaningful exercise and reducing your sedentary behavior improves so many things and really is one of the most beneficial things you can do for your body. Like I said, we're not going to harp on this kind of thing too much because everyone knows you need to do more exercise. So let's move on to the next part of this podcast, which is the types of exercise and kind of breaking that down. So as I said, we're going to be talking about two main umbrellas, which is your cardiovascular exercise and resistance exercise. Now, cardiovascular exercise is pretty much aimed at what it sounds like, improving your cardiorespiratory fitness and your endurance, really. And this happens through kind of uh, what they call your VO2 max, which is your ability to kind of use a maximum amount of oxygen and have that process be very efficient. Um, this comes when you are using your muscles continuously in exercise. So when you think about this, this is types of exercise such as jogging, running, which are the most basic form on your feet. Um, and then when you think about it, there's also other forms such as like biking, rowing, climbing, hiking, rollerblading, kind of anything that uh, you continuously use your muscles and it's a longitudinal exercise where you don't take breaks in between. I mean, you can take breaks when running, but typically you're not like running for a minute, stopping for a couple minutes, running for a minute. It's more of a continuous type exercise. Some of them are harder than others. And this is where you can look at the list of kind of the moderate intensity versus vigorous intensity exercises. On the other hand of that is resistance exercise. And this is typically aimed at increasing muscular strength and size. So this can take many forms, but when people think about it, typically they think about going to the gym and lifting weights, pumping iron, right? You have your dumbbells, your barbells, all those kinds of things, but it really can take many different forms. And at its base definition, it is resistance exercise. So that's anything that kind of you have to exert force against. 
And that can take the form of household items, um, such as like you just pick up a giant bag of rice that you might buy at Costco, one of those things of uh, bottled water, a case of bottled water that you could get at Costco, wherever it is, just anything that's kind of heavy, heavier than you typically would see, like maybe a laundry basket full of books, whatever it is, and you can use that as resistance. Um, you can also use resistance bands, which are very popular and very commonly used. They're easily like pretty affordable and you can use them in a variety of different ways. You can do body weight exercises. Um, you can use machines and then all the way up to free weights, which are kind of what people consider the gold standard of resistance training. When in reality, it's just another form. It's not like it's necessarily better than the others, but typically you can use more resistance because they go up to like 100 pound, 125 pound, whatever it is. And when it gets to barbells, you can add as much weight as you want. So resistance exercise is also typically thought of anaerobic uh, exercise, which means kind of not using oxygen or not really utilizing your VO2 max. But if you start lifting like continuously doing supersets, drop sets, or not having long rest periods, then you can also somewhat get some aerobic benefits from this as well. And that has been shown in the literature, although typically people don't think of it that way. And most of the time when people are lifting, they are having longer rest periods. So it doesn't really count as endurance exercise. Now, I'm not going to harp on that once again too much because a lot of that is obvious to you guys, um, our listeners who are incredibly smart. So we're not going to talk about that much. What I really want to talk about in this episode is kind of making exercise accessible and kind of uh, looking at the obstacles that some people face when it comes to resistance exercise. So let's talk about some obstacles that people face with the first one being the perfect paradigm is what I call it. And this is the thought process or the just like um, idea that when you do a form of exercise, whatever it is, whether you're running, climbing, lifting weights, biking, you have to do it perfectly. And this is exacerbated by scrolling through Instagram as you see so many people that are fitness professionals ex executing exercise perfectly. They have these perfect seeming exercise protocols, whatever it is. And people think that if I don't have a perfect plan, then I can't start because I'm going to get injured. Injury is a huge thing. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as another obstacle. But the perfect paradigm really stops people from getting started because I think if it's not perfect, it's not worth it. So I won't do anything. Well, this can't be further from the truth as any exercise is beneficial. And something that I want to add, actually, now thinking about it to the previous guidelines is that we have those minimums. But what they're finding is that kind of any amount of exercise is beneficial. And previously, they thought that you had to get like 10 minutes of exercise at least for it to be beneficial, like to get any benefit out of it. But now anything that you do, whether it's like you walk five minutes is beneficial. So that's good. So you can really do anything. It doesn't matter if you have the perfect plan where you have to be at the gym for an hour and a half. If it's 10 minutes, if it's five minutes even, great, you will get some benefit out of it. So that's the perfect paradigm. Um, and then moving on to that, it's kind of another extension of that, which is the overcomplication of exercise and thinking that every execution of exercise has to be perfect. Now, this is um, also including a little bit of fear of injury, but what you see and what I've been seeing a lot of Instagram um, thankfully, coming from a lot of meme pages as well, making fun of these things and educating people that these things are false is that people talk about having perfect form. And if you don't have perfect form, then you're going to injure yourself and creating this fear of injury that gets people not exercising. And this can come in a bunch of different forms as well. So when it comes to lifting, people say if your um, squat is off by just a little bit by this hip degree, but if you're not using a wide-toed shoe, if you're losing narrow-toed shoe, then you might get injured and it might not be beneficial. So you probably, they don't say this, but the implication that people get from this is that you shouldn't be exercising if you're doing this and you should fix this. Now, once again, this isn't true. You shouldn't be thinking about overcomplicating exercise because um, kind of at its crude base, if you think of us as humans, even 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, we didn't have all this fancy equipment. We have our body, which is incredibly resilient and incredibly capable of kind of doing whatever you want it to do um, to some extent, obviously. So just get in the gym and do something. If you don't have like the perfect lifting shoe, if you don't have those uh, heeled shoes to squat, it doesn't matter. You're still going to get a benefit from squatting um, and you don't have to have like this perfect form with that squat shoe as you'll still get great benefit, probably will not be injuring yourself as the risk of injury from lifting is really minimal. When it comes to running, um, some people think that you have to have um, 
like the perfect shoe to run. And if you don't have some like expensive $250 running shoe, then you won't be able to go running because you'll injure yourself and then you'll get a stress fracture. There's a bunch of people who actually run marathon in Crocs. And like, there's a bunch of people who run barefoot. They're not necessarily going to be getting injured as long as they have the appropriate training volume and they stimulate and they like provide a stimulus that'll make sure that they don't get injured. A lot of this comes from not thinking about overcomplicating exercise, but just engaging in it. And then also when you think about kind of programming of exercise, you have people talking about these interval exercises, uh, high intensity exercises, tempo training, all these fancy um, exercises that they're doing with resistance weights. You don't have to do those. Don't overcomplicate it. Do the very basic exercises and you'll get a lot of benefit from it for health. Now, if you're getting into competition, then it might be a little bit different because there are some things that will increase your efficiency a little bit more at the lift. So you can get a little bit more poundage, which matters in competition, makes you a little bit faster um, and helps you train at like kind of the correct stimulus that you need for competition. But if you're not competing, then it really doesn't matter. Just do something. Now, the other thing that I talked about um, briefly is your fear of injury. Now, once again, there's a lot of fear mongering when it comes to injury where people once again say, if you don't have perfect form, if you don't do all these complicated warm ups and cool downs, you're going to get injured. You probably aren't. Um, the highest risk of injury comes from kind of team sports and uh, sports such as like football, like American football, soccer, and all of those kinds of things. So um, unless you're doing those, you probably don't have that high risk of an injury. Running does have a little bit higher risk of injury according to the data, but even that's not that high. And if you were just engaging in resistance training, the risk of injury is incredibly low. So I wouldn't necessarily worry about that. Just get in the gym and do something. Um, another obstacle is time. And once again, people think that you need to have an hour to an hour and a half to get any sort of meaningful exercise in. But like I was saying, the data is showing that no matter how much exercise you do, you will get some benefit from it. So if you can only make it to the gym for 30 minutes, there's nothing wrong with it. And on top of that, don't think also that you need to warm up for 30 minutes before you start lifting um, because you don't necessarily need to have like these complicated stretches and like just different body positions, activation exercises. Just start squatting and obviously don't go up to your top set. Like if you're squatting 300 pounds, don't go up to that like without doing anything, but you can start warming up by squatting. So start with like no weight, add on like a little bit of weight and just keep progressing until you get to your main set. And it honestly shouldn't take that long to warm up. Um, so if you're in a time crunch, you can still fit it in. And the other thing there is that once again, any exercise is beneficial. So if you can't make it to the gym that day, let's say you only have 15 minutes, um, go home, find some sort of like get a backpack, put some books in it, do all those kinds of things and find a time make it happen, just exercise. It doesn't matter how long it is, just do something. And if you break down the exercise guidelines, 150 minutes a week is not super long. If you break it down into just like the five business days, that's 30 minutes each day. And if you break that down into several like intervals, it could be three 10 minute like spurts of exercise. It could be a 30 minute combined. It could be six, five minute things of exercise. Really just find what works for your schedule and make it happen. And then the last one is resources. Once again, this plays into a lot of them, um, a lot of obstacles that I was already talking about. And a lot of these can honestly be lopped together now that I'm talking about them. But once again, this is people thinking that you need squat shoes to squat. You need um, running shoes to go run. You need a specific bike to go bike and do it well. You need all these like fancy equipments, which you don't. Honestly, exercise is very basic, as I was saying. Find something that works for you within your resources. Identify what you have and kind of do what you can within your capability. The next part about this, before I go on ranting about that into a circular loop, is accessibility. Now, the accessibility of exercise can also take a variety of forms. So I'm going to address it from kind of two perspectives. And one of that is education. Now, when it comes to fitness and exercise, unfortunately, there is so much misinformation out there and a lot of it, which is frankly harmful, whether that's uh, directly through like increasing people's injury risk or subconsciously through telling them they can't exercise unless they do things perfectly, which ends up leading them to not exercising, which does harm in an indirect manner. Um, so when when things like that happen when you scroll through instagram you see all these people that just have plausible looking information but theoretically could be harmful through um i don't know i don't want to call out specific accounts here but like they fear monger people into not exercising thing making things convoluted just there's a lot of misinformation when it comes to exercise and then also when it comes to knowledge people don't look at the um 
like credible sources such as the CDC or health.government, which are really good resources for exercise, actually. And they tell you kind of what the basics are that people can be doing to benefit themselves. Instead, they look at Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, all of those kinds of things, which is their, where their information comes from. And I'm not going to get into it, but a lot of that is either misinformed or just bad information. Um, when it comes to general population and knowledge on exercise, there's just a lot of bullshit to overcome. And there's a lot of people who are doing great work to overcome that. And hopefully they can continue to get a louder voice and we can overcome it. The last part about this uh, education wise is healthcare providers. Now, when uh, I've talked about this on several episodes with our guests, but when it comes to healthcare providers, they generally are not very well read or understanding of what exercise is. Um, a lot of times if you go to the doctor, um, like the physician, and you're telling them about um, needing to exercise, they'll oftentimes recommend, oh, like make sure you're doing your cardio exercise. And they're not recommending resistance training at all. Or if you mention you are resistance training, then they say, oh, make sure you don't get injured. You can get injured really easily. Like if you squat poorly, you can have a bad back. You can blow, bust your knee. All those kinds of things which are heavily misinformed. Um, once again, the rate of injury is very minimal from resistance training. And you probably are not going to do it unless you're just like trying to max out every single session doing stuff which is beyond your capabilities. So more healthcare providers flat out need to get educated on exercise and hopefully we can make a dent in that um, kind of putting out these uh, episodes talking about exercise and addressing misinformation when it comes to the healthcare space. The next part about this is public health initiatives. Now, obviously, this is beyond the scope of what we can personally do with this podcast and probably what one person individually can do unless they're higher up in government. But this is things like make outdoor recreational spaces more accessible. So when it comes to some populations, they might not have access to a fitness center. Like they can't go to a gym um, readily. They have difficulty getting there because their transportation um, is limited. So they can't really travel that far. Um, they have limited access to resources. They're financially constrained. So they can't purchase resistance bands, dumbbells for the home, all of those kinds of things. And in those instances, outdoor recreational spaces are actually hugely beneficial. If you go to like your local neighborhood gym sometime, sorry, if you go to your local neighborhood park, sometimes they have these little gyms built in, like a lot of calisthenics type stuff. And that is very beneficial. And there is research showing that when those things are around, um, the individuals around that area are generally a little bit more fit because they're more inclined to exercise because it's available. It's there. It's an option that they can use. And for those people that use it, they will get some great benefit out of it. So that's that. Um, and then another thing is when you think about gyms, when it comes to like resistance training, um, kind of looking at gyms for treadmills, a lot of them are privatized. And this is something that I've been thinking a lot about where you have a lot of private gyms. You have like your chain gyms, like your LA Fitness, you have your exports, you have your Planet Fitnesses, your nicer ones like your Lifetime Fitnesses, your Equinox, all of those kinds of things. And you have to have a price to those where like you pay a membership and you get access to them. Or unfortunately, a lot of people either don't have access, like physically they can't reach those gyms or they don't have the resources to pay for those and have that monthly membership. Now, one of the things here that is very important to point out that I actually got from a financial book is you don't necessarily have to get a membership if um, you're not going to use it that much. So let's say a membership for a gym is $100 a month. And... Um, they have a day pass that's available that you can get for like $15. Let's say you go to the gym maybe uh, twice. No, let's not use twice a week. Let's say once a week to do like resistance training with weights. Instead of getting that membership, like first of all, look at your schedule, see how many times you realistically would go to the gym. If you only go once a week, it's probably is more financially reasonable to buy four day passes, like one each week, rather than get a month of membership. That way you say $40. The other hand of this is public gyms. So have gyms kind of readily like the, um, what's it called? The outdoor recreational spaces that I was talking about instead of outdoor recreational spaces also have them as gyms, like community gyms that members can use and engage in resistance training. You have like, um, accessible trainers there and all those kinds of things, which greatly increase the amount of time. And, uh, it kind of reduced the amount of friction that it takes for people to go exercise. So that's another thing that I would be super beneficial that I think would be beneficial. And then the last one is something that I was reading on, which is um, when it comes to city planning, obviously this is very difficult for cities that are like very well established, but making cities more walkable or bike friendly. 
when we think about trends in kind of how people are living these days, there's a lot of people moving to the suburbs. And the problem with suburbs is that everything is far apart. I don't know about you, but when I want to go to like the grocery store, if I want to go to the post office, if I want to go to the gym, I have to drive everywhere because it's like a at least two miles apart. Everything's far away. So if you're going to be walking everywhere, then it's going to take a lot of time out of your day because it's just inconvenient, right? So if you have cities that are like a little bit more denser with better city planning, then you can bike there. If you have bike friendly lanes, then it's more accessible. More people are inclined to bike places. Um, and I think the city of, I think it was Copenhagen just has like a car free day, I believe. Uh, someone can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I read an article that says like they don't have cars on a certain day and everyone bikes or walks. And obviously it might be a little bit uh, inconvenient for some people, but it greatly increases the amount of time that people are exercising and engaging in some sort of physical activity to reduce that sedentary lifestyle epidemic. Because times that we are sitting in cars, obviously we're sedentary, we're not doing that much. And instead, it'd probably be better to walk somewhere or to bike somewhere to decrease our amount of sedentary activity. So that's it for accessibility. Um, I hope this podcast kind of summed up a lot of the thoughts and exercise currently that we have. Um, and that kind of addresses aspects from what is exercise, um, the general guidelines for exercise and why it's important battling the sedentary lifestyle epidemic, why exercise is great for health outside of weight loss, the different types of exercise, and also ways to make exercise more accessible so that more people can meaningfully engage in it and get benefit out of it because it could greatly increase the health and act as preventive medicine for a lot of different maladies. So um, when it comes to future directions with uh, podcasts, one of the things that I want to do is I want to have a podcast where we strictly address exercise when it comes to healthcare providers. And, and that's in the context of um, kind of exercise as a prescription, how healthcare providers can help people engage in more meaningful exercise, because I really think that is a uh, burden that should be placed on healthcare providers, whether it is either additionally add on top of physicians, which is going to be difficult, frankly, because there's already so much to do or integration of more um, exercise professionals into the healthcare field versus being kind of a separate field off in the distance, all those kinds of things. So I want to have an episode solely dedicated to that so that we can find ways to get more people engaged in exercise. Now, that's for this episode. I hope you found some benefit in it. Um, I know it's kind of rapid fire. There's a lot of it. There's a lot of stream of thought, maybe a little bit of rambling. But if it was beneficial, please consider subscribing to our podcast on wherever you get your podcast. That's like um, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, what it, whatever it is. If you are on Apple Podcasts, help us out by leaving a review. Um, it helps us continue to grow, reach more people, and spread the message of preventive medicine. And lastly, if you want to stay in touch with us and make sure that you get all of our updates, aside from the Instagram algorithm, when it decides to show you, then make sure you get on our mailing list at our website. That's for this episode. Thank you all for listening.